the horse star. Preface. The earliest home of the gods that we can discern is the sky. Although an aura of mystery surrounds the religious beliefs of the ancient Egyptians, this much is certain. They were obsessed with the stars and planets. Their leading gods were identified with the most prominent celestial bodies. The pyramids were purposely patterned after a celestial prototype, the Akhet, and elaborately decorated with stars. And their single-minded goal, upon dying, was to return to a celestial hereafter, wherein they hoped to be reunited with the Great Mother Goddess and the imperishable stars. In the face of the abundant and unequivocal evidence attesting to their profound interest in astronomical phenomena, it stands to reason that Egyptian religion is fated to remain elusive until we gain additional insight into that culture's core beliefs regarding the stars and cosmos. The present monograph attempts to summarize the data at hand and reconstruct the celestial background and mytho-historical context of ancient Egyptian stellar religion. To read the standard works on Egyptian religion is to learn that the sun was worshipped as Horus, the moon as Thoth, Orion as Osiris, Sirius as Sothis, and the circumpolar stars as the imperishable stars. It is our contention that each and every one of these oft-cited identifications is erroneous, and should this claim be substantiated, it follows that modern scholars have thoroughly misunderstood the original astronomical context of Egyptian religion. Indeed, as we will attempt to document this monograph, the time for a thorough reevaluation of the available evidence is long overdue. Horus and the Deceased King Horus, the first king in the pattern of rule and authority, royal ideology and ideas about the hereafter, seem to have cosmological and stellar foundations which they well go back to pre-dynastic times. The pyramid texts represent the oldest body of religious texts in the world, and as such they constitute an invaluable resource for reconstructing the world view of the ancient Egyptians. Inscribed on the pyramid walls of pharaohs from the 5th and 6th dynasties, their primary purpose was to serve as an aid to the deceased king in his post-mortem ascent to heaven. The basic message of the Ascension hymns in the pyramid text can be summarized in short order. The pharaoh aspired to ascend to heaven in order to achieve a transfigured state as an ak. As a result of this magical transformation, which was held to occur within the akat, it was believed that the deceased king would be reborn, or otherwise rejuvenated, after which he would shine forever, thereafter, as an imperishable star. To this relatively straightforward summary, one which most Egyptologists would doubtless accept, he would append the following corollary beliefs. 1. The deceased king ascended to heaven in the form of a star. 2. The king ascended by means of a tangible structure, most commonly by a ladder, but also by sunlight or some other extraterrestrial contrivance. 3. The king longed to be reunited with the JTN, commonly translated as the solar disk. The king's transfiguration involved a mysterium conjunctionis, specifically a physical reunion or rapprochement with a stellar mother goddess, personified alternatively as Hathor, Isis, or Nu. Confronted by this peculiar belief system, already fully developed by the time of Eunice's Pyramid, circa 2350 BCE, the question naturally arises as to how to explain its origin. We will return to this intriguing question in Chapter X. The pyramid texts contain a veritable gold mine of information about ancient Egyptian conceptions of celestial topography and various stars overhead. In order to reconstruct the mytho-historical context of ancient Egyptian funerary beliefs, it is first necessary to identify the star embodied by the deceased king. It is our view that the god Horus, already identified with the star in the third millennium BCE, represented the divine prototype for the post-mortem ascent of the deceased pharaoh. PT 928 is instructive in this regard. I go up on this eastern side of the sky where the gods were born, and I am born as Horus, as him of the horizon. Purposely emulating Horus, the deceased king here ascends to the Akhet. The Egyptian word translated as horizon by Faulkner 
the sight of his much anticipated magical transfiguration it is doubtless no coincidence that the deceased king's final resting place corresponds precisely to the celestial locus traditionally assigned to horus as horus resides in the akat so too does the deceased king the king's place is at the head of all the august ones who are in the horizon as horus resides at the front of the imperishable stars so too does the deceased king if horus resides at the front of the stellar spirits so too does the deceased king if horus settles in the solar bark so too does the deceased king additional examples could be provided as well but this brief summary should suffice to demonstrate a significant overlap with respect to the celestial stations associated with the deceased king horus star the striking correspondence in celestial placement in turn constitutes compelling circumstantial evidence that the mythology associated with the egyptian pharaoh purposely modeled on the astronomical behavior and mythological career of the horus star see chapter x this deduction in turn naturally begs the question is it possible to securely identify the horus star the horus star pharaoh is horus and of this god little enough is known horus was the power of kingship to the egyptians this was as much a force of nature as those embodied in the other gods it was manifest in two phenomena the sun the most powerful force in nature and the pharaoh the most powerful force in human society horus's role as the king of nature is probably the origin of his name Haru seems to mean the one above or the one far off. This is apparently a reference to the sun, which is above and far off in the sky. Like the falcon with which Horus is regularly associated and with which his name is usually written. The great gods confront us already at the dawn of history. The Egyptian Horus is a case in point. His preeminence in Egyptian religion being evident everywhere, the pharaoh himself was considered to be the earthly embodiment of the god a belief system reflected in the so-called Horus name borne by Egyptian rulers from the first dynasty on. Yet, if it is commonly acknowledged that Horus represents the quintessential Egyptian, there is no consensus as to his or fundamental nature. That he was a celestial power, all authorities concur. The question, however, is what celestial body best explains Horus's manifold functions in Egyptian religion. A survey of the relevant scholarship on the matter reveals that Horus has typically been identified with the sun. That said, leading Egyptologists have advanced arguments that the god is to be identified with the planet Venus, with the star Sirius, and with the amorphous sky itself. It is our opinion that all of these interpretations are not only erroneous, but fundamentally misguided insofar as they reflect a fatally flawed methodological approach to Egyptian star religion, namely, an attempt to force fit the earliest descriptions of the most prominent celestial bodies to the familiar phenomena of the current solar system. The fuzzy thinking and faulty methodology which predominates in modern Egyptological circles is evident in the following statement from Rudolf Anthes. The heavenly Horus was a star as well as the sun, and perhaps also the moon. It seems as if he was that celestial body which appeared conspicuous either at day or at night. In order to bring some clarity to the difficult question of Horus's celestial identification, it is instructive to review archaic traditions that have survived from the prehistoric period. The cult of Horus is prominent already in pre-dynastic times. Rulers from the Nakata period, for example, worshipped the falcon god prior to the unification of Egypt. In the early dynastic period, circa 3000 to 2600 BCE, Horus is explicitly identified as a star. Thus, an annal from the first dynasty reign of King Aha bears the name Festival of the Horus Star of the Gods. Early royal domain names likewise reference the Horus Star. The domain established by Anajib first dynasty was called Orsaba, Horus, Star of the Corporation of Gods. Hotep Sekemwe, second dynasty, founded a domain called Orenkan Sabah, Horus, risen as a star. Kasekemwe, sounds like consequently, domain was called Hursab. Horus the Star of Souls. Most significant, perhaps, is the domain established by Djoser at the beginning of the Third Dynasty, named Darius Sabai in TPT, some crazy names, Horus Star at the front of the sky. To judge by the evidence of these names, Horus was conceptualized as a stellar power, indeed, as a most prominent star at the front of the sky. As valuable as they are, however, 
The epithets in question are not sufficiently informative to pinpoint exactly which particular celestial body represented Horus during this period. In addition to his status as a prominent star, there is clear evidence that Horus was identified as a powerful warrior very early on. This idea is apparently already in the pyramid text, as the following spell from Queen Neith's pyramid testifies. Well, they sure don't look like the Great Pyramid, do they? And that is a big question. Why is the Great Pyramid so much better than all these? That's rubble for the most part. So ascend to the sky amongst the stars in the sky, and those before you shall hide, and those after you shall be afraid of you. Because of this, your identity of Horus, of the Duat, of the one who strikes them, of the one who spews them out and wipes them out, and you will strike them, spew them out, and wipe them out at the lake of the Great Green. You shall come to stand at the four of the imperishable stars, and sit on your metal throne, from which the dead are far away. And all these uh, gods of theirs were like killers. I would think that the creator would be a benevolent creator of love, not death and murder. Anyways, it would make sense that these are planets for that reason. The name of early pharaohs likewise bear witness to Haru's warrior prowess. Today, Wilkinson offered the following observation. The Horus names of several first, the Horus names of several first dynasty kings express the aggressive authority of Horus, perhaps reflecting the coercive power of kingship at this stage of Egyptian statehood. Names like Horus the Fighter, Aha, Horus the Strong, Dujur, or Arm-Raising Horus, Ka, called, uh, not to be confused with the Ka, or maybe it is, called to mind the warlike iconography of the earliest royal monuments from the period of state formation. This evidence, taken in conjunction with early dynastic domain names, sounds like the internet, suggests that the stellar Horus was imagined as a formidable warrior. As we will document, this portrait of the god constitutes a decisive clue as to his original stellar identification. Additional information regarding the star god Horus is to be found in the pyramid text, dating from roughly half a millennium later, at circa 2300 BCE. Horus was not the sun, as often maintained, is suggested by various hymns, wherein the god is explicitly distinguished from the ancient sun god Ray. Ra, Ra, from the ancient sun god Ra. In the following passage, for example, Horus, as the deceased king, is implored to, to ascend to heaven and join Ra. If you prefer it called Ra, I'm just calling it Ra. I found that they're just spelled different. It's the same god. It's Amun Ra. Ra summons you into the zenith of the sky as the jackal, as the jackal, the governor of the two in needs. And it's. And it's. And as Horus. As on TMNIT. May he set you as the morning star in the midst of the field of rushes. Here, as elsewhere in the pyramid text, Horus is identified with the morning star. In this guise, Horus is described as the son of the sun god, and thus he would appear to represent a distinct celestial body altogether, presumably a particular prominent planet or star. In order to clarify the origins of Horus's cult, it would be necessary to identify the celestial body signified by the epithet morning star. Yet this too is easier said than done, insofar as the earliest Egyptian texts, such as the pyramid and coffin texts, never describe the Horus star in a clearly recognizable astronomical context that would enable a secure identification with a particular star. Instead we read that the morning star, as Horus, ascended to heaven in order to command the imperishable stars in the celestial hereafter. Raymond Faulkner considered it a foregone conclusion that Venus must be the stellar body referenced by the phrase morning star. Thus, in a survey of Egyptian star lore, Faulkner wrote as follows. As regards to the identification of the morning star and the lone star, the actual celestial bodies there can be little doubt that, as elsewhere, the morning star is phosphorus, Venus as seen at dawn. Rolf Krauss has produced the most comprehensive and informed study of Egyptian star religion to date. He, too, would identify the Horus star with the planet Venus, citing as evidence various passages in the pyramid text that purportedly describe it as shining in the eastern portion of the morning star, of the morning sky, while moving with respect to the other stars, a characteristic of planets rather than stars. Krauss summarized his findings as follows. As early as the beginning of dynastic times, Horus seems to be identified with the planet Venus. The names of the so-called royal vineyards describe Horus as a star. The name of Djoser's vineyards reveals that Horus is a particular star. At the front of the sky, the identification of Horus with Venus 
as known from the pyramid text suggests itself yet the identification of horus with planet venus is not known from the pyramid text quite contrary as we intend to show indeed krauss has simply assumed what has yet to be proven that early references to horus as the morning star have reference to venus and argued in a wholly circular fashion lord of the nether world what then do the pyramid texts tell us about the horus star horus's epithets offer a wealth of insight into his astral identity reoccurring epithet of the god is dua conventionally translated as nether world and written with the following determinative the word duat in turn is derived from the root dw3 morning whence comes horus epithet nether dua signifying morning star or morning god the etymology of duat suggests that horus's identity as the morning star is indissolubly but he uses some big words doesn't he words i never heard before indissolubly indissolubly connected to his role as lord of the netherworld indeed a passage from the pyramid text sets the two epithets in high position o morning star horus of the netherworld divine falcon bird whom the sky bore although often sought for underground the earlier texts confirm that the duat was celestial in nature the following passage is especially telling in this regard make the sky clear and shine on them as a god may you be enduring at the head of the sky as horus of the netherworld horus is here described as standing at the head or front of the sky as lord of the dua this epithet together with the fact that horus star is said to shine and clear the sky would appear to conform the duat's location in a prominent place in the visible sky overhead other spells implying that the duat is to be found in close proximity to the ancient sun god point to the same conclusion especially relevant here is the following passage from the pyramid text wherein the deceased king ascends to the duat in order to be near ra lift up your faces you gods who are in the nether world duat for the king has come that you may see him he having become the great god the king is ushered in with trembling the king is robbed guard yourselves all of you for the king governs men the king judges the living within the domain of ra the king sits with those who row the bark of ra bark is another word for boat i do believe the king commands what is good and he does it for the king is the great god samuel mercer in his commentary on this particular message acknowledged the duat's fundamental identity with the domain of ra the dw3t is that even a word oh, it's the duat the duat here is heaven identical with the land of ray ra which is heaven where the king becomes a great god the intimate association between horus duat and the region of the sky occupied by the ancient sun god is also evident in the following passage wherein horus is said to illuminate the sky from his station in the duat near ra ra has taken me to himself to the sky to the eastern side of the sky as is this horus as the dweller in the netherworld as this star which illuminates the sky in apparent contradiction to its intimate association with the ancient sun god the pyramid texts elsewhere describe the horus star as standing in close proximity to the imperishable stars the latter conventionally identified with the circumpolar stars thus in the following passage the deceased king is identified with horus duat and set among the imperishable stars may you go up as horus of the netherworld who is at the head of the imperishable stars horus duat is here described with the epithet translated alternately as head or front of the imperishable stars taken literally this passage poses a seemingly insurmountable problem for the conventional view that horus is to be identified with the planet venus since the planet can hardly be said to stand at the front of the circumpolar stars in its current orbit venus never moves more than 45 degrees from the ecliptic and is thus far removed from the circumpolar region at all times to summarize a wealth of circumstantial evidence suggests that horus of horus sop the ancient egyptians were describing a star otherwise identical with the horus duat the latter star god being explicitly identified with the morning star by the authors of the pyramid text and so far as horus duat is to be identified with the planet mars it follows that Horus Sop, likewise, 
had reference to the red planet. This identification will prove to be of profound and far-reaching significance when we turn to consider the celestial identification of the Sothis in the next chapter.